truth. I'm part of I'm I'm penitentiary. This call is not private. It will be recorded and may be monitored. If you believe this should be a private call, please hang up and follow facility instructions to register this number as a private number. This call is not private. This call will be recorded and may be monitored. If this call is to an attorney, the attorney should hang up and dial 405-425-2515 to register this number as a private attorney number. My name is Anthony Sanchez. DOC number 275098. I am incarcerated at the Oklahoma State Penitentiary in McAllister, Oklahoma, on death row. Can you tell me what your relationship like was like with your mother and father growing up? Uh, I had, I, my, personally, I thought I had a wonderful relationship with my father. My mother... Uh, not so much. My stepmother, I have an awesome relationship with. Um, I really don't know my biological mother like that. I was not raised with her. Was there any abuse ever in the household growing up? I mean, there were some things that I'm not proud of, and I mean... Uh, there, I mean, it depends what you def, de, de, it depends what you consider abuse. I mean, I I was a kid. I got spankings when I, I when I acted up. You know, I mean, I guess I, I guess I could say I I I didn't get a spanking that I didn't deserve. I guess. So there was no like. Um, beatings or any uh, violence toward your stepmother or yourself in the house? I mean, yeah, there was. How often would you say that happened? Uh, It just just when you have eight drinks. Just people get yeah, stupid when they drink. Oh, when, so they were drinkers? Yeah. Do you have any fond memories of your father? I do. I do. Uh, I mean, he was there for all my football games. Um, we played baseball, wrestled. I mean, he was always there for me. Do you have any negative memories uh, that stick out to you of your father? I mean, as far as I, I mean, what do you mean by negative? I'm not understanding that question. Like, do you have any do you have any negative memories that stick out to you from your childhood um, in regards to your father? Do you mean like like when I'm getting spankings and stuff like that? Just anything in general, like anything that might have been traumatic or anything that sticks with you to this day that might have been more negative than positive? No, not really. Okay, so I know we don't have much time, so let's talk about the crime that you're in prison for, that you're on death row for, for that matter. I know you've always maintained your innocence, so I must ask you, how did you wind up being involved with this case, let alone convicted of this crime and sentenced to death? Well, um, I was convicted on pure circumstantial evidence. No physical evidence at all. 
No hard evidence, just pure speculation and accusations. From the start of my trial, I tried to relieve my trial attorneys. They attended the same church as the victim, Miss Julie Buskin. My trial judge also attended the same church as the victim, Miss Julie Buskin. I was forced to wear leg shackles and handcuffs throughout my whole trial. The jury was all white. I'm Indian and Mexican. So, and I know that I'm not, the, my family's not the only Hispanic Indian people in Norman, Oklahoma. I mean, that's not a fair trial at all. My trial lawyers never talked to any of my seven alibis or called any, any of them to testify. My trial lawyers never verified where I lived or went to school. My trial lawyers never talked to my father or my mother or any of my family or friends. I, I mean, I'm, I'm innocent. I said I was innocent from the beginning of this. I had no part of it. I don't know nothing about it. And I've had these, it's like, how do you have trial lawyers that attend the same church as the victim represent you? It's not like I'm in a little bitty town. It's Norman, Oklahoma. It's, 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 it's a good sized town. It's not like everybody knows everybody. And I mean, it's just, there's a whole bunch of different things that, I mean, I can prove to you that the district attorney lied during my trial. I can also, what I think proves my innocence to you. I'm proof that the district attorney lied. The district attorney said in trial that I lived at 813 Drake Drive with Kristen Martin and my father and mother in December of 96 when Julie Buskin was murdered. The district attorney lied because if we got evicted in 1995, and if my trial lawyers would have talked to my family and done a little homework, they would have known that. And they would have known that I lived in Moore, Oklahoma, not Norman. And I went to Moore High School in December of 96 when Miss Buskin was murdered. The district attorney put on a state's exhibit 88, which is a pair, which is, which is a picture of the killer's footprint with a tape measure. And he said the trial was size nine. The district attorney lied because if you look at the tape measure at Mark toe to heel, it's a hair under 10 inches. And on a Brennock device, 10 inches is a seven and a half to eight shoe size, not size nine. If my lawyers would have paid attention, they would have caught that. But even more, if my lawyers just would have just even even cared, they would have known I wear an 11 and a half wide. Not a size 8, not a size 9, not a size 10. The killer's footprint, according to the district attorney, is a size 9. I wear 11 and a half. I can't shrink my foot. I've worn 11 and a half since I was probably 11 or 12 years old. How about you? Was your shoe size, has your shoe shrunk? You probably had the same size since you was a teenager, too. Right. But... Nobody, no, nobody cared to look at that. Nobody, nobody, nobody even bothered to check it out. They did whatever they wanted to do. And then district attorney kept saying in trial that I used Miss Julie Buskin's cell phone to call my ex girlfriend. Then my my ex girlfriend has texted my mother, and on her text, she she says that that was not her phone number in December 1996, that they're lying. And I know for a fact that my mom has that on her cell phone. And, I, I mean, if again, if my lawyers would have just talked to my family, they would have known that too. And then the district attorney agreed an order testing the DNA evidence in 2005. And she, they stated that the DNA would be completely consumed on this test. And they sent the DNA to Relia Gene Technology Incorporation in New Orleans. So to me, how could the DNA even be tested in there if, in New, Orleans, if the, New Orleans was underwater because of Hurricane Katrina? So how are they saying that they got tested there if it was underwater? That's a, they, they couldn't have been. 
So that's four valid lies told by district attorney. Now, proof of my innocence, there's 49 fingerprints, 49. None of them belong to me, not one of them. The eyewitness, Kay Merriman, she drew the sketch. And I was told she drew Julie Buskin, and, and she drew Julie Buskin to the T. So if her sketch looked just like Julie Buskin, she wouldn't be that far off from the killer if she drew the killer too. And she did draw the killer. And it looks like a way older man. And I had just turned 18 at the time. So she couldn't have been that far off. So nobody ever bothered to check that. And when she was asked in trial if the killer was in the room to identify him, she didn't identify me. And if you look at State's Exhibit 88, and real good, and with t- it's got a tape measure next to it, and you take my bare foot, no sock, no shoe, and you put it on an acetate paper, my foot completely engulfs the State's Exhibit, proving I couldn't be the killer. And if you look at the medical examiner's autopsy report and the state's exhibit 88, you can tell it's a left-handed shooter. The entrance is to the lower left side of the head. The killer's feet prints are to the right side of Miss Julie Buskin. I'm right-handed. This proves I couldn't like, shoot a gun like that. This report shows the bullets going from left to upper right, so that's definitely a left-handed person. Nobody checked that. The autopsy report also shows chronic inflammatory cells to her libido and her anal, which are signs of healing. Dead people don't heal. So the autopsy also shows no signs of any rape of any kind. No murder weapon has ever been found or linked to me or any of my family members. No ballistics has ever been matched were linked to me or any of my family members. And back then, I had hair to the middle of my back. None of my hair was found. And anybody that has long hair knows your hair is everywhere. And my hair was everywhere except the crime scene. And again, I lived on West Franklin Road in Moore, Oklahoma in 1996 and went to Moore High School. Proof that I didn't live on 813 Direct Drive in Norman. No one ever bothered to look up my cell phone records to compare it to the state's exhibit 141. And no one ever, no, no one ever, um, called my ex-girlfriend to testify. Why would my lawyers not even just do a little bit of this? I mean, if they would have just asked. And you know, the DNA was taken in 1996 while Joyce Gilchrist and her team were still working. In fact, Joyce Gilchrist did not get fired until well after my trial, proving something was wrong with the DNA in my case all the way around. And if you look at Curtis McCartney's case, it almost mirrors each other. And again, that's 10 ways to prove that I'm innocent. I was convicted on pure speculation and accusations. No hard evidence at all. None. And Mr. Dodge, I appreciate you um, talking to me and um, trying to get my story out there because uh, I am innocent. And it's awful being in this place. Do you have any other type of questions? Yeah. So, so after you were convicted of this crime and received your sentence, which was death, do you remember what your reaction was then? I was devastated. I was, I mean, I was in shock. I was like, how, there's no way. How could you kill somebody on pure circumstantial evidence and somebody who said that they were innocent from the beginning? It doesn't make no sense. This is America. This isn't no third world country. Where was my representation at? Where was, where were my lawyers? How come they did not? The questions that I just put forth to you, I answered for you. 
my footprints, the DNA. They did whatever they wanted to. They didn't even let my family in the courtroom. So it was like I was standing in front of a whole lot of, like, I don't know how to say it. It was just like a bunch of white people. There was no brown people in there whatsoever. It was scary. I was terrified. And they said death. And, man, everything in me just, I don't know, man. It's just scary. It's still scary. It's hard. So what's your experience been like on death row? You learn a lot about law that you never wanted to learn. It's a scary experience. I wouldn't wish this place on my worst enemy. This place is awful. There's nothing, I'm absolutely nothing good about prison at all. But at the end of the day, prison's not the worst thing. There's nothing worse about this prison than be losing out on the life of my children. I had to watch my children grow up behind bars, actually the door from death row. That's the worst. That's the absolutely worst. You don't know if your kid's hurt. You don't know if your kid has clothes or food. And it's awful. That's the most worst thing that's happened. How do you deal with that? A lot of prayer, a lot of, a lot of prayer. It's, it's a very difficult, that's the most difficult thing that I've ever had to experience in my life. And it's still going on to this day. I mean, there's not a day that goes by that I don't think of any one of my children. And I, I want to be there for them, but I can't. And um, I have a good spiritual advisor who helps me. I mean, he, uh, they, they, uh, they talk to me quite a bit about it, and they pray with me, and I get it off my chest, like what I want to say and what I. But at the same time, I, this is awful. This is, I, like I said, I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy. Cause being away from your kids is the worst. It is. So you have quite the support here on the streets. How does it feel to have people rallying behind you, believing in your innocence enough to advocate for you? It feels wonderful because I have lost all hope. I have sat here and screamed that I'm innocent until I was blue in the face and nobody listened. And this spiritual man came out of nowhere and did his own homework and looked into my case and looked for himself and how these lawyers just kept doing their own thing and not not actually telling the truth not and actually not fighting for me. He seemed but he also seen where I had tried to fire them before he ever came along, where I had trouble with these lawyers, where they wouldn't put my, just like I told you, they wouldn't put my, what I thought proved my innocence forward. They kept doing some other things that I didn't approve of, but I'm not a lawyer, so I, I, I don't know what I was supposed to do. Nobody knows what they're supposed to do down here. So we're just supposed to listen to our lawyers and that's that, because nobody, there's nobody here to explain things. And I think every, each and everybody that's out there is supporting me. I do. I'm so grateful. I'm very appreciative of all of the support that I have. It's wonderful. So, Anthony, do you have any regrets in life? Um, I do. <laughs> I do. I have a lot of regrets. <laughs> I regret a lot. Is there anything in particular that you wish you could go back in time and do or or you could have taken advantage of something? 
I, I wish I would have stayed in school. I wish I would have learned law. That's, I mean, like I said, you know, being in a prison, it changes you all the way around. And uh, it makes you wish that you would have paid attention in school more. It wish, I, I mean, there's a lot of things that, I mean, I wish I would have listened to my mom more. Wish I would have listened to my dad more. Is there anything that you'd like the public to know about you or this case in general? Um, yeah, I do. It's a tragedy that Judy Buskin lost her life. If I killed Judy Buskin, why would I stay around doing my time and paying my debt for what I'd already done? Why would I risk it knowing that I would be rearrested and do serious time? Unless I truly didn't do to the book. And in fact, I'm innocent, like I've been saying this whole time. It's true. I am innocent. And it's it's just it's it's disappointing to know that somebody had lied on me. It's unfortunate that someone has decided to lie about me and my case. And I'm grateful that the good people have ran to the press and blew the whistle on all of those liars and forced their accountability to the press. So the whole world knows that they're lying on me and that circumstantial evidence should not be what put somebody on death row. You should not be allowed to kill somebody on pure circumstantial evidence. And that's, it's crazy. And I mean, it's, this is very stressful and hard. It's it's real stressful, and it makes it makes poor people very vulnerable to whatever these lawyers and these judges would want to do. It's like they can choreograph their own motions without any input or consequences. But at the end of the day, I really want to thank the people for sending my family love and prayers. We are very grateful, and I, and I I feel all of their love. I just want to tell everyone how much their support means to me, including you. I know that I, this is the first time I've talked to you, but you took the time to talk to me, and I, I appreciate that. Um, I am innocent, and I've been sitting here this whole time and nobody seems to believe me. And I and I'm I don't know how to prove my innocence. I don't have I don't have hundreds of thousands of dollars to get the best lawyer. I don't so I can't I can't do like the other people do. So here I am talking to you. Thanking you for your time. Anything else? So before we conclude this interview, is there anything that you would like to end with? The awful thing is, the person that killed Julie Buskin is still out there, and there's no one looking for the real killer. Everyone thinks it's me. You know, it's an awful feeling when you know you're innocent and no one backs you up. It's, it's traumatic. It's, uh, I don't understand how, just cause I'm, I don't come from a rich family, that this type of, this type of like lawyers and judges ruling and doing what they want, I guess this is acceptable to everyone in law and the community. Cause nobody, even at my trial, nobody like, Hey, that's not right. Hey, no, that's not right. You know, I was tried in handcuffs and shackles for no reason. Not one person said, hey, take them handcuffs off of him. This is a trial. Not one person. Not one person looked up at that jury and said, hey, that's a brown kid. Why is there not a jury, any members of his peers up there? 
sitting out and being tried by my peers, doesn't that mean like the same color, the same race as me, from the same ethnic background? I mean, if I was black, they'd be screaming it off the top of their lungs. There wasn't a black person on the jury. So what's the difference? But, and I, I, I do want to end with saying that my heart goes out to the Buskins. I can't even imagine losing a child like they did. Um, I've lost three children myself and it's, it's, it's awful. But how they lost theirs, I feel for them. My heart aches for them. But they need to know that I'm innocent. And the whole world needs to know that I'm innocent. Thank you for your time. Unforbidden. Truth. I'm, 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 I'm.